I am Vinny Totterton, folks. <clears throat> Your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent at the beginning of this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean, kind of like the guy we're going to have on the show today. The ladies, I didn't ask him off the air, but I don't know if he is or is not married, but I was reading up on this guy. His bio reads like something you would see on a dating site. <laughs> Dr. Chaffee is an American medical doctor, specializes in neurosurgery. So look, this guy is not a bone doctor, just mending bones. This is neurosurgeon. We're talking the brainiest of the brainies. And he didn't go to just any school. No, 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 no. He went to UW for what I can tell. Did a little uh, study in molecular and cellular biology and chemistry. Wow. That's a mouthful. But wait, there's more. This guy is an American athlete. Yeah, he played the original football. I'm talking about rugby. That's right. We're going to figure out if he played fivers or sevens or whatever he did. I don't know what he did. Maybe he did it all. He's probably impressed that another American know what fivers and sevens are. Who knows? Uh, and then uh, that wasn't good enough. Now, he... he uh, he went after the genocide in Burma. He went down there and started helping people pull their stuff back together. Uh, he, uh, he also, uh, he, he goes everywhere. He's in Perth. I think he's in Perth now because we're 13 hours apart. I tell you, if I had a vagina, it would be wet right now. Folks, I'm talking about Dr. <laughs> Anthony Chaffee. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Vinny. How are you? Good, good. Um, did I get any of that wrong or right? You went to UW, right? I have for my undergraduate degree. I went to University of Washington. Yeah. Yeah. What you got to remember is I don't do any notes when I do a podcast. So I read something about you a week ago and I have yeah. a partial, I say a partial, um, what do you call that? Photographic memory. Mm -hmm. It's not a real photographic memory or I would have known that. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe that wasn't in the notes. You're in Perth now, right? Did I get that part right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah, because you said 13 hours ahead. And I went, oh, he's Perth. That sounds like 13 hours. That, that sounds like Australia. And then uh, you did go down to Burma. Or was I making that part up? I know. I went to Bangladesh, yeah, to help with uh, the Rohingya refugees that were coming from Burma. So there was a, a genocide. It's now called Myanmar. But they, yeah. um, they well, the unofficial numbers are they killed about 200,000 people in a month. Unbelievable. And, you know, yeah, in about you know September 2017, and about a million people fled into Bangladesh to escape that, obviously. And you know they just didn't have they didn't have enough doctors, they didn't have enough people helping because you know it wasn't like a sexy humanitarian crisis like Haiti or Nepal. It was just a real yeah. one. Yeah. And so you know Bangladesh is is quite dangerous anyway. ISIS was very active at the time. They were you know there's a lot of bombings and killings, so people were just steering clear of that. And I felt you know, sort of obligated at that point, you know, because no one was going and I, I you know, I, I couldn't justify not going because of that. So I ended up going down and um, volunteering as a doctor in the refugee camps in Southern Bangladesh, just outside of a place called Cox Bazaar. Um, and yeah, it was, it was exactly as, uh, as uh, it sounded. It was, it was a very, very intense time, but um, you know, I'm glad I went because everybody that I saw, you know, would not have been seen. Otherwise we had, I would see anywhere from, you know, 30, 60, 90 patients a day. And there would be a, a line of 200 people waiting outside the, you know, the clinics and the, and the field hospital that we had set up, um, you know, at the, at the end of the day. So we, we never saw everybody, you know? And so you have, you have one less person. Well, that many people that they saw would not have been seen. So, um, yeah, so it was, it was pretty wild, but yeah, I felt I had to go. You know, it's amazing. Uh, a close friend of mine, I had her on a Saturday show a while back. She's now, uh, well, she she sold her practice at some point in Beverly Hills, and uh, she was a big time. She had a big uh, a cancer practice, and uh, she figured out that all over Africa these and all over the world, these women are dying of cervical cancer. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was one of these things where you can you can meet them and treat them on site with, I think I, I'm not making this up. Maybe I'm making this part up, but you can use like a, a, a vinegar to fix the problem. It, it will mm. kill whatever the, the bacteria is that causes the cervical cancer. Okay. And um, it's a see and treat thing. And she started these clinics all over the world. 
And yeah. um, I think about that, you know, it's like you think about doctors, you know, you guys take this, this Hippocratic oath and you do all this stuff and you first do no harm and all the stuff, you know, and amen and go be a doctor. But very few doctors do what what Patricia Garden did or, or what Anthony Chaffee is doing, where you go to places and actually put your balls on a chopping block. How often does that happen? I mean, what you're doing is not a common thing, right? No, it's not that common. Um, <clears throat> you know, people do try to do uh, humanitarian work to, uh, you know, impoverished countries and so forth. And some are more dangerous than others. Um, but, you know, mo a lot of people aren't sort of going into, you know, the more dangerous areas like your your friend is doing. My, my father's uncle, you know, one of sort of the my early inspirations for being a doctor was my father's uncle who, you know, there weren't any of these, you know, sort of, uh, you know, missions sort of things set up, but he wanted to go to Africa and he just, just went, he um, uh, ended up getting a church to sponsor him to go. And he just started setting up clinics in, I think, uh, East Africa back when it was, um, you know, colony. And, uh, and he just started setting up these little clinics and things like that. And he would, uh, he would put, he got this, it was like a MacGyver episode where he took the tires off of a car. And so it would go on a train track and he would drive on the rails between these little places. And he had this huge circuit and every day he would go to a different little village and he'd do, uh, you know, see a lot of people, treat a lot of people. And he was doing tons of cataract surgeries and so forth and training up local people to do cataract surgeries while he was gone because there was so much need. And he, he just got out and he did it and he wanted to do that. But, um, you know, some people do, you know, I, I spoke with, uh, you know, Dr. Sean Baker, uh, one of the first mm -hmm. uh, sort of interviews I did. And, you know, he, he's done similar things like that. Uh, I think he went down to Peru and uh, it was very difficult. Um, you know, some of these things are a bit of, you know, disaster tourism is sort of what it's called, where, you know, people go to, you know, some of these things where they're doing you know, humanitarian work, but they're staying in five-star hotels. It's, you know, they're doing a sort of a couple of clinic days and then they go, uh, you know, hiking in some, you know, idyllic place and have a, you know, communion with nature and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, I was talking to uh, some people back in Seattle that had done some things like that. And, and I had just gotten back from Bangladesh and, and, you know, uh, one woman I was speaking to, she looked at me and says, Oh my God, did you love it? Did you just love it? Can you just not wait to go back? Oh and I was like, um, I think we had to, you know, say I, I was doing that. I go to Costa Rica every year and it's just so amazing. I was like, I think we're talking about two very different experiences. You know, when I, you know, when I was going there, ISIS was, um, you know, blowing up, they, they blew up a hotel because there was one American staying there, you know, killed and maimed everybody else. They were blowing up restaurants and cafes. They were, you know, taking them hostage and executing everyone who couldn't recite the Quran in Arabic. One guy did recite the Quran in Arabic. They said he could leave, but he said, well, you know, I can't leave my friends. So they shot him. And so that was, you know, that's what I was going into. I remember reading that on the, the uh, U.S. Embassy website. And, and, you know, usually they say, well, this is, you know, this is very, very dangerous. You really shouldn't come in unless you have to, you know, you know, use extra caution and so forth. They didn't say anything. They skipped right past that and said, it is not safe here. Do not come. Your life will be in constant danger and wow. you will likely be killed. They said that on the website that you will likely wow. be killed. And so, you know, I looked at that. I was like, well, I don't want to just walk into a death trap, you know, but I really want to help these people. So I emailed the, the embassy and I said, okay, look, is it, is it really that bad? Are you just, you know, sort of cautioning people, you know, I'm, I'm a doctor, I'm trying to get down to the refugee camps. You think that's possible. Sure. Um, and the only re reply I got was we stand by every word of that statement. It is not safe here. Do not come. So I went, but you know, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, I sort of, you know, had, had, uh, you know, quite a lot of trepidation and, and I, you know, thought a lot about what I could do to keep myself safe and so forth. And there were, there were close calls. I didn't, you know, run into ISIS or anything like that, uh, directly, but, you know, as one of our translators said, uh, it was that, that ISIS was so prevalent at the time and they're actually quite well supported in the community that no matter where you go, no matter where you are, somebody is in ISIS and, you know, you're saying that, you know, right now, someone here is in ISIS, and it's not someone that just supports them and think they're good guys, but someone who's, you know, fanatical to the point that they're likely willing to kill or die for the cause. And so that was something that you had to be very, very, very careful about. It, it makes you wonder, you know, if, if ISIS, if, if the organization was smart, hmm. 
they would go strange bedfellows. We don't like Americans. This guy's obviously he can't, you know, recite anything. He's not a Muslim. So mm. we want to kill him. But wait a minute, he's saving ours. Yeah. You, you, do you think there's any version of that where they go, well, we'll let Anthony live because he's saving our people? Or is that just you got lucky? How, how does that? Well, you may not know the answer, but you must yeah. have an idea. Oh, I've, I've certainly thought about it. And, you know, when you have a little a plaque that says doctor on it, you know, hanging around your neck, people treat you very differently there. Um, and so I think that that absolutely did help me. And as soon as I noticed that, I recognized that people really just changed their behavior towards me when I had that little plaque that said doctor, I wore that thing all the time. You know, I wasn't trying to be a, you know, a douche and be like, oh, I'm a doctor, but I, I was just, it was literally a safety thing. And, you know, people were, were quite, uh, you know, quite different, quite very, very thankful and grateful. Um, you know, there's a lot of doctors I worked there. They were absolutely fantastic. There's some, you know, professor level doctors that I worked with, um, with, um, uh, it's not Operation Smile. It's a similar one called Smile Train, where they come down to do cleft lips and palates and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so, I joined up with, with a team that was doing that and uh, you know, it was helping. I, I don't do cleft lip and palate surgery, but I did you know, my sub-internship in plastics reconstructive surgery at Duke. So I had some you know, you know, uh, experience assisting in that. And you know, you can, you know, if you know what you're doing in the operating room, you can assist on basically anything really. So I was helping out with that just you know, because they needed extra hands and, uh, and it was interesting and I liked it. And you know, so um, they were excellent. You know, these are professor level surgeons. They're, you know, they go to, the, you know, the UK or, or America every year and they train up. And, and some of these people are actually more skilled than anyone in the West because they don't have, you know, all the, the equipment that we have. And so they have to, you know, they have to, like, the anesthesiologist could do all the different, uh, you know, regional blocks and things like that by body anatomy, just by regional anatomy, he didn't have an ultrasound to, you know, uh, find, uh, you know, the different sort of nerves that he was looking for. He had to know where they were on the body. So these guys wow. were excellent. But the drop off from that was severe. You know, you'd have someone that went to medical school 20 years ago, you know, in Bangladesh, never had any further training after that, didn't, hasn't gone overseas and so forth. And they're doing the same things that they learned in medical school 20 years ago. And it's like, okay, it's moved on since then. And, and so there was a, a, a serious drop off from there. And so the, the people knew that and they, they recognized that, you know, uh, some of the doctors they would see it was, it was sort of a, you know, a, a gamble. And so whenever they'd see, you know, a foreigner that's a doctor, you just, they would flood to you. And so they really appreciated uh, foreign doctors and so forth. So I absolutely think that that helped me. Um, I had some people came up to me and, um, you know, sort of confused because there were people going there uh, from overseas. Uh, most of the doctors were, were Muslim and they were, you know, trying to help, um, you know, the, because the Rohingya people were uh, Muslim people. And um, that was sort of a, 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 there's a bit of a racial divide in, in Burma as well, because between uh, different religions. And so that's part of it as well. You know, but they, they would come up to me and they would sort of ask me, you know, like, um, you know, are you, you know, you're a doctor. I was like, yes, you know, and they said, well, are you, are you, are you Muslim? Uh, is that why you're here? And I was like, well, no, I'm not Muslim. I'm just, I'm just a person. And these are people, you know, I'm not helping people right. because they're Muslim. I'm helping them because they're people and they need help. And I think they really appreciated that as well. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, Bangladesh is, I mean, literally they came up, they, they came up to my nipple. I mean, it was, you know, we go out to a crowd of these people. Like it was like, you stood, stood out, like, you know, like you're in the land of Lilliputians. Like you, you could not be missed uh, being someone might say, I'm six, three. I'm not, I'm not the biggest guy ever, but I was way bigger than these guys. And they were, I was like the largest human these people had ever seen. They have no sense of personal boundaries. <laughs> and so people would just come up and just like grab my arms. Go, oh my God. And like, just start taking selfies <laughs> with like my arms. It's and crazy, stuff. right? We, we yeah. were touring. Uh, I was doing speeches around uh, India about five years ago. And my business partner came with me because there was some opportunity from one of my companies there. And, uh, Andy is like six, five. Yeah. And they treated him as if Tom Cruise was in town. Yeah. And, and, yeah. You know, it was like everyone, I, can, can we get it? What were they calling it? A snap? Can we get a click? Can we get a click? Get a click? Yeah. And they would all pull out their cell phones to, to get a picture with, you know, looking up at him yeah. and holding their hands up. And it was like the weirdest thing. It's like, Andy, you yeah. should move here. You'd be like this 
sex symbol, 65 yeah, years exactly. old sex symbol, you know, and yeah. uh, you know, just, just a whole crazy thing. Um, I could talk about that all night, but yeah. you, you and I have some things in common. I, I'm a very mm -hmm. low carb guy. And you took it one yeah. step further. You're, you uh, are, are, are mm -hmm. you're carnivorous, just like the yeah. aforementioned Sean Baker. Um, and the thing that you and I also have in common is uh, we're both athletes. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, just to give you a little background on me, I, I played D1 football through college. And then when you look at me now, you go, wait, he looks like a decrepit old man. It's because I played D1 football. Um, <laughs> I, I, I need discs in my neck and everything else at this point. Um, then, of course, there was a lot of beef on it. You know, we, we had eggs and beef for breakfast. We had beef for lunch. We had beef around the clock. Yeah. And, um, of course, there was carbohydrates in there, you know, stuff like Gatorade and whatever. But there was no, in 1981, there was no thinking about this stuff. You know, if you wanted to play American football, you ate a lot of red meat. As I would always say, we were living like lions on the Saturday. Yeah. You know, we would sleep, we would eat, we would work out, and then go right back to sleep, eat, and work out, right? And most yeah. of that eating was a bunch of protein, a bunch of animal protein. Um, so that was the order of the day. My degree is, is in exercise physiology and nutrition. And I started noticing right away how food affects. You know, I was always interested in this. Um, yeah. I, I always stayed on a high meat diet my entire life, except after football, I decided to ride a bike everywhere and I became, um, an ultra athlete. This is in the days, Anthony, before ultra athletes were a thing, mm -hmm. right? So for me to, um, to get on the bike and ride for 36 hours nonstop, well, you can't take a piece of meat with you. You just can't, yeah. right? You know, I, I had things like bone broth and this sort of thing, but not in training. That was in the car that would hand something mm -hmm. to me on a race, right? We would have things yeah. like bone broth and they would hand me sandwiches with sausage in it and that kind of thing, because it's stuff you can hold in your hand while you're doing 20 miles an hour in a desert. Um, but in training, there was a lot of maltodextrin because maltodextrin is you can put it in the Mylar package and it's easy, right? Yeah. <clears throat> I had this thing where people say, well, you used to use a lot of sugar. Yes, I did. When I was off the bike, there was a lot of meat. When I was on the bike, there was a lot of sugar. And then I would always take a break from the, the mid-October all the way through the beginning of January where you couldn't force me to eat pasta, rice. I wouldn't even go to a sushi yeah. restaurant, nothing, because I was so sick of that stuff. And I would always yeah. make a comment. I feel better in the off season and everybody would go, yeah, because you're not riding a bike 23 hours. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's that kind of thing. It's like, no, 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 no. I have less inflammation. I feel better. And it wasn't until after I had cancer in 2007, I had leukemia mm -hmm. um, that I finally said to myself, I'm going to do one more cycling season using carbohydrates. And then I'm pulling back from them altogether. And even in that season, I cut way back. If I wasn't sitting on a bike seat, I barely yeah. had a carbohydrate. I was proving that it could be done. And then after that, just went total low carb, you know, and mm -hmm. it was one of the early adapters on the internet to bring this mm -hmm. low carb thing to the world, right? Through this podcast, we've been doing this for 10 years now. You were a rugby play, player. Um, by the way, did you play fives or sevens? Where did you, where did you play? Tell me about your career. Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I started playing uh, 15. So I started, you know, rugby union. That was what was... Okay, so uh, big stop, okay. Yeah, so that, that was what was around. So I, I, you know, I grew up in, in uh, Southern California, but then when my family moved up to Seattle when I was 10. And there, there was just a, one of the top... I just got very lucky. There's one of the top teams in North America was in Seattle. Uh, still is. You know, we have the, the rugby, MLR, Major League Rugby. And um, my, you know, my Seattle team, they won the first, first two inaugural uh, championships. Um, and that's all the same sort of people. You know, it was like a guy, you know, Kevin Flynn that I grew up playing with. He was a professional in England. And then he was just traveling through Seattle and just sort of, you know, came up and play, played a couple of games with us and was just like, yeah, I'm hooked. He actually gave up his professional contract to play 
amateur in America. Um, and so he's, you know, he's in charge of the MLR uh, Seattle team now, or at least he was anyway. And, um, you know, so I, I, I had a lot of great people to learn from and to learn with. I had a, a sort of a strong sports background before that. Again, getting very lucky. Um, I, I started um, fighting, doing, you know, pancreation and Muay Thai kickboxing, you know, MMA uh, at AMC Kickboxing in Kirkland, which is with uh, Matt Humes, one of the top trainers in the world. And, um, you know, he was my, my coach for my 14th birthday on. He was also my wrestling coach growing up. And, uh, you know, I just, I was, I was there every hour of every day that it was open. I absolutely loved it. I was training with all the professionals and, you know, they were getting ready, you know, fighting the UFC and so forth. And I was just trying to just sponge everything up. So I already had that, that, you know, background of, of training as a professional, like with all these other professionals, even though I wasn't fighting professionals, amateur, but um, cause I was under age, I was still a kid. Um, but then when I took that into rugby, I still had that same, that same drive and motivation and, and work ethic in rugby. And so I, I put all that in there. So I got a lot out of that. And I was an all American my second year and uh, traveled with, um, you know, the junior national team uh, down to New Zealand for a month. And I was just like, this is, this is what I want to do um, for a while. I had started <clears throat> university at university of Washington when I was you know, 15 and uh, so I figured, you know, I'm ahead of the game anyway. I can, I can afford to take a couple of years off before medical school. So let's see what, see what rugby has for me. <clears throat> I ended up playing, you know, a lot of my career with Seattle. We played in the Canadian Premiership, which was their sort of version of uh, professional rugby there. And, and it, was, it was a great competition. Uh, and we had, you know, 30 games a year that we were playing. Um, and then I would play sevens in the summer. And again, you know, it was just, it was, Seattle is a very special place for rugby. You know, you could probably write, you know, a, a chapter in Malcolm Gladwell's, you know, Outliers book about Seattle and rugby, because for some reason, it just had all of these amazing, like international superstars wow. in rugby that just showed up and just lived in Seattle because that's where they wanted to live. There's a big Islander community. There's a guy named Luke Aaron Avula, who was captain of Fiji, coach of Fiji for like 10 years. He, he's literally a legend. He's, he's on a stamp in New Zealand. Wow. And you know, and he just, his wife got cancer and they took her to the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle because that was the best place to go for what she had. And he just stayed there. And so I, I learned how to play sevens from this guy. He was, you know, a couple of years out from winning, you know, being captain and coach of the Fijian national team and winning the world cup, you know? And so, and the guy was just phenomenal. And, you know, so I, I got to play with this guy. I got to learn from this guy and still, still friends with him. He's a great guy. Um, you know, the, if people know uh, Sarevi, Sarevi was Luque's little protege and he took over and basically took over the same role as Luque was, you know, like the you know, pinnacle of seven. Like he's just, you know, people think of him as, as one of the best, if not the best. And Luque, you know, basically who you talk to, it's either Luque or Sarevi, right. the best ever. And Sarevi is up there now. You know, he's been up there for a while after he retired. I don't know exactly where he is now, but he's started some uh, some things up in Seattle as well. So got very, very lucky with all these people. And <clears throat> as, you know, there wasn't professional rugby really in America. You could play very high level rugby. But, you know, I was, you know, I was on, you know, um, you know, championship winning team, you know, winning national championships, playing in, you know, all-star, all-star games, winning all-star championships at parks, you know, in like random parks in, in Florida with, you know, some lady walking her dog going, oh, what is that? And it was like, this, this is a national championship, but, you know, they didn't really know it. But um, if you wanted to play professionally, you had to go overseas. So people like myself uh, went. And so I went over to England and I ended up playing in the Champions League and, uh, you know, just really enjoyed it. I, you know, I, it, was, it was sort of weird, you know, that I, I knew I was good enough. I knew I could do it. And I just, I just went, I just hopped on a plane. I started making some calls and said, look, this is who I am. This is where I've played. This is, this is some of my background in America. Like, I just want to try out. And uh, three teams said, well, you're, you're welcome to try out. And I went up and I made all three teams. So, oh, wow. um, and yeah. And so I ended up uh, choosing a team, uh, Newbury, which is right outside of Oxford, uh, because I, a, a friend of mine that I had played with in, in the U.S. Uh, was going to Oxford and they said that he was playing there as well, which it didn't actually end up turning turn out to be uh, all the way true is, is that he played for Oxford and we trained with Oxford on certain days. And I'm like, well, that's not, that's not really the same thing, but uh, I ended up going there anyway. And, and while I was there, I just was interested in, uh, I was always, you know, obviously going to go to medical school and, 
you know, I was, I was visiting Dublin and my coach on the, the junior national team that we went to New Zealand with Tony Smith was a head coach at Trinity college there. You know, it was a great, great university, great, great rugby institution. And, you know, I, I was just having a great time. I was hanging out with the guys on the team uh, Dublin at the time was just the place to be in Europe. It, they had a very low uh, corporate tax rate. So all the big oh, wow. companies, industries were there. And so just all the industry was there. People from all over Europe were, coming to, to Dublin and Ireland uh, because that was, that was just the center of commerce. And it was absolutely amazing. And some of these guys found out I was going to go to medical school and they said, you know, why don't you, you come here? There's, you know, you can, there's great schools, there's great uh, rugby. There's thing called the hospitals cup rugby team, which is the oldest rugby tournament in the world. It's very prestigious. You know, the cup is like made out of like silver and platinum. It's, it's right. insured for half a million dollars and things like yeah. that. 150 years old. And I said, you know, yeah, that sounds great. I had a, you know, sort of an informal interview with their head of anatomy and physiology. We really hit it off. And you know, she said that she wanted me to go there. So that was always my plan, but I wanted to sort of finish out playing rugby. And, um, and I, I had a year left at university at the time as I I'd, I'd taken time off. So I wanted to sort of finish those up first. Um, but I always had that in my head. And so that's where I ended up going back later. You know, my grandfather was a, was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, did his doctorate there. And, you know, I have all these great stories of him being in Europe and actually like being in Germany when World War II broke out and Indeed. fleeing across the, yeah, fleeing across the, the, the continent to get away and uh, ended up being a, a spy in World War II. He was one of the first uh, American spies, was the first American spy to turn and work an enemy agent uh, against the enemy. And, oh, wow. Um, yeah, yeah, and he um, he uh, toured with uh, Bill Clinton around for like you know the 50th anniversary of the D Day or something like that, and um, and so he was uh, you know quite you know had all these just amazing stories. So I was just like, oh, maybe I can have you know something similar to that as well. And so you know when it was time to go to medical school, I, I went there. I went to the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, and um, and then you know played rugby at Trinity as well. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, I kept playing rugby and, you know, but I just took some time off from, you know, from going to medical school to just, just pursue that and to play, uh, you know, at the highest levels I could. I had a couple, uh, very unfortunate injuries timing wise. Uh, I was up for the world cup, uh, in 2003 and I was, um, really pushing to get on that team <clears throat> and I broke my leg in a, oh, uh, in a rugby oh. game. Yeah. So was playing in the Canadian championship. Um, and, uh, a guy intentionally did my foot got caught in a ruck and the guy just grabbed it and just twisted his whole body. Just, and, uh, which bone you know, is breaking your leg? Uh, my distal fibula. So on my right leg, so uh, oh. right by the ankle. Yeah. And so I had a, an unstable fracture there. And I remember sort of getting up and, you know, when you get sort of, you know, I'm, I'm sure you sort of have experience with this. If you ever had an injury. Oh, I'm you know, we a, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So when you have like a big injury, you know, something, you know, something, you know, middling, it can just hurt a lot. When it's something like big, like you just broke a bone, you usually don't feel anything. You get, you know, there's this rush, you know, of the endorphins and so forth. And you go, something's wrong. Yeah. And you, but you don't feel anything. So I didn't, I couldn't feel anything. I just knew something was very wrong with my ankle. And so I got up and I stepped, <clears throat> tried putting weight on it. And I could feel my foot sort of slipping away from my, from my leg. I was like, oh, okay, all right, that's not good. Yeah. And, um, our fullback at the time, because it was like, you know, we're, you know, like five minutes left in the championship game. We're down by one point and uh, we're the only American team in this Canadian league and they hate us for it. And so, you know, we really <laughs> wanted this win. And, um, you know, our fullback just calls, Chafee, get in there. So I'm like, well, guess I'm not going out. And so I go over, hobble over, and uh, I just sort of went on all three. So I put my hands down and my left leg down and I just curled my right leg up behind me. And I would just throw myself into people's legs. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't like uh, chase them. I, I had to yeah, be just on the yeah. side of the rock. So if they're doing a straight line at me, you know, I was just going to be, you know, roadblock in there. And, uh, and um, I, I knew that if my foot touched the ground, it would just you know, rip off my leg. And so I just had to keep that up, but I just did that. And I sort of bear crawled over and you know, did it again, did it again. And I ended up getting through the, the game without completely destroying my ankle thankfully. And, um, but that was it for, for that year's world cup. Um, that really boned me out. Um, I wanted to sort of check that off and then, you know, maybe go to, you know, go to medical school with a, with a clean conscious, but, uh, it didn't happen. So I was like, well, that's not going to happen. So I just rehab myself and I was saying, well, you're not going to make it back to the, you know, the international level. You're not going to do this, that, and the other. I'm like, well, we'll see, won't we? 
And so yeah. it took, I think I was on crutches for five months. It was very, it was because yeah, I it destroyed the ligaments and everything like that as well. I destroyed the deltoid ligament, how to get that reconstructed and, uh, and, you know, had a plate and six screws in my leg. And, and so it was, a, it was a long recovery. My, my leg, you know, atrophy down, it was like, it was like as thin as my arm. It was just like, it didn't look, it was like, you know, sort of alien limb syndrome. I'm like, that's not my leg. <laughs> and, uh, and it looked really weird. And then, so I just, I rehabbed it and I was just like, right. You know, that, and that's what I, uh, I want to go to England. I'm like, right, I'm going to England. I'm going to, I'm just going to do this. And, uh, and I just showed up and I just started playing and, um, and people were like the way I played. So, uh, you know, that, that worked out. And then, so I was able to get back up to being looked at for the you know, national team sort of things. Um, I was in the running for the 2007 world cup again, uh, I was living in San Diego, playing in the Super League down there with a team called Ombak, which is a great club and great people there. Some of my close close friends are, are from that experience, and <clears throat> and so I was just sort of you know pushing to get on that team, and then I broke my hand. I was actually outside oh, of uh, <laughs> outside of rugby. Um, it was just we were at a at a club in in San Diego, and I was with my girlfriend at the time, and I caught these three guys stealing her purse, and so. Oh you know, I had to, had to beat him up. And but in the, in the meantime, you know, I, I broke my hand while I was doing that. And so, uh, that, at that point I just said, right, I'm not doing this, this again. I'm not, I'm not taking another four years off, um, progressing right. my life, um, you know, to chase after another world cup. Um, and so I just, you know, I just, I, I was still playing rugby. I was still doing that, but my focus now was, was, getting into medical school or studying, you know, 14 hours a day for the MCATs and things like that. And, you know, and so, so I did that, but I, you know, I kept playing rugby, you know, I even had to, you know, in my interviews and things like that, they were like, well, you know, you've played professional rugby before. Uh, how do we know that you're not just going to come here? You know, this right. was, <laughs> why, for Ireland, why do you come here and then just start playing professionally again and just, you know, you know, chuck medical school to the side. And I actually had to convince them. I was like, no, look, I've, 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 I've sort of, shifted gears like my i'll always play rugby i even told him i was the interview was in new york i was like look i actually have my rugby gear in my bag just in case like yeah. <laughs> something something happens like i know i'm not going to but you just do this as a rugby player you know because you just love playing the games so you just always bring your kit because every now and then you just meet someone and go oh actually there's a game you know you want to play i'm like absolutely um but you know it's like but my focus now is is medicine you know i've sort of i've been there i've done that i've i've you know, didn't accomplish everything that I wanted to, but I've accomplished a lot and I've really enjoyed it. And now I want to, you know, continue on. And so I did, you know, I, I, you know, continue playing in medical school and beyond, you know, recently I haven't really had the time, you know, I'm you know, working anywhere from 90 to 130 hours a week, uh, you know, in, in neurosurgical training. And so it's just, it's not really possible at this point, which sucks because I feel better than I, I literally ever have. Uh, yeah, and, and you look great. And I want to get into that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> by the way, did, did you ever come uh, run across uh, Nate Ebner at all in your rugby career? Do you know who Nate Ebner is? For the Patriots? He plays for the Patriots, yeah. but he was also a uh, yeah, rugby seven. player. Yeah, I, I know of him. I don't know him yeah. personally. But yeah, I know I, I know that you know he played on the on the Olympic uh, seven team. Yeah. Yeah, and um, was he recruited by the Blacks or one of those teams? The Blacks are down in New Zealand, or is that Australia? Uh, well, the, the All Blacks are the New Zealand oh, wow. national team. Yeah, but that so he wouldn't um, be eligible for that unless he was from New Zealand. Okay, um, I, I didn't realize. That. Maybe I'm thinking yeah. of someone else because Nate's been on this show a couple of times, mm -hmm. and he, that that bastard will never give me an answer. I go, listen, yeah, you play rugby. <laughs> And you've played American football. Which one is tougher? And he won't yeah. give an answer. He's just missed yeah. Mr. Politics. He won't talk. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't well, know. I think, I think, yeah. yeah. Well, I think I think his you know his his bread's being buttered by the football side of things, so he can't yeah. say. I mean, he, because he, obviously you know if he was playing football and and um and that was the hardest one, he's oh yeah, absolutely football, this that and the other because it's going to keep <laughs> his employers happy. But uh, I, I yeah. don't think they would care either way as long as Nate. Yeah. Is is winning championships for him, which they're not winning anymore. Um, <laughs> I need to get a handle on you. I mean, you're in college at 15. So obviously, you skipped a few grades. You know, we, mm. we, we can't just buzz by that. So yeah. we're talking, you know, super smart kid. Uh, grandfather's a road scholar. So you know, the genetics, the, the, the mental genetics of that. So you have the gift. Um, you're not saying that
I, I had a friend whose son was that guy. Um, and it, these are very, after he, they skipped him, I had a couple of times, the parents started worrying. It's like, wait, he, he's not yeah. socially adjusting. Did you have that kind of problem, you know, you know, being the, the Dookie Hauser, if you will, in college at a young age and having to adjust? And did you use athletics to, to help you adjust? Uh, yeah, well, actually, I did have a problem with that. So, you know, my sort of uh, road into that was there was a program with the University of Washington where if you took the SATs at any point in your, your uh, education, you and you got above a certain score, you could start taking classes of matriculated students. So a good friend of mine, who's now you know uh, you know corporate attorney in Seattle, uh, you know he was sort of you know he's a very bright guy. You know he was you know me and him uh, you know were, were basically we were the only ones who, who could sort of compete with each other to keep up with each other in school. Everyone else was um, uh, not able to. And so he, you know, he came up to me and said, Hey, you know, there's this program, do you know, do you want to try it? And I was like, yeah, sure. You know, when is it? He's like, Oh yeah. You know, it's next week. I was like next week. Like, I can't, I can't do that. You know, I don't have a book. I haven't studied. And he's like, look, we're 13. Like it just do it. It doesn't matter. You know? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's, that's a good argument. Um, so we, we both took the test. We both did very well. And uh, you know, the point wasn't to then go to college. It was just, you know, just a why not sort of thing. And maybe we can, you know, get away with not having to take this crap in high school. Yeah. And, you know, but, you know, we were taking uh, different classes, you know, I was taking all the, you know, the math and science classes, you know, ahead of time. And I was going from the junior high to the high school, you know, taking calculus and taking biology and chemistry and all these sorts of things, because I really liked them. And by the time it was ready for me to go into high school, I I'd sort of looked at it and I'd already taken all the math and science classes that they had available. And those were, you know, what I was most interested in. And I, you know, I thought to myself, well, what's the point of, of going at an accelerated pace if I then have to stop and end up at the same place that everyone else is when they graduate high school, except I'm in a worse position because I've forgotten everything now that's fresh for them. And I'll have to retake this stuff. Like that's going to be a disadvantage. And so I said, okay, look, let's just start, let's just keep it going. And so I started uh, you know, taking college classes and I was still technically a high school student, but I was taking all my classes at, um, at the university. And so, uh, but I would play, you know, sports in the high school and so forth. Um, I had, I had a big time, uh, big problem adjusting and, and fitting and, and <clears throat> in my own mind fitting in because I felt sort of like, like an imposter. And I was just like, Oh, if they find out that I'm just a kid, you know, they're going to think differently of me. And so I was really embarrassed about that. I was, you, know, you know, looking back, I should have been, you know, proud of it, you know, but like I was, yeah, uh, I was very so you're insecure, you, you know, you, yeah. you're not quite <clears throat> sure which way you're supposed to comb your hair and everything else and do all yeah. that cool. And how <clears throat> do I look and how do people judge me? And we have all of that. I need to get a handle on your, uh, how old are you now? Because you still look like you're 12. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm actually 41. So um, yeah, I've just, you know, I think, I think it's, is combination of things, you know, but I, I, I never drank during the rugby season. Um, well, when I turned 21 before that, you know, I drink after games and things like that, but then I found out it just felt so different after, yeah. after, um, games, if I didn't drink at all, if I didn't drink during the season, I just, I was performing wildly better. And at the same time, I sort of came inadvertently, uh, across a, a, a carnivore diet, carnivore way of eating when I was about 20. And so at the same time, I just did that. And so I haven't really, you know, I, I drink maybe, you know, once a year, um, sometimes often less. And so I never did that. I never smoked either. And I've been doing sort of carnivorism, heavy meat eater my whole life. You know, my, my sister, uh, you know, as a kid, she, you know, she sort of went vegetarian. And I remember asking my mom, like, what the hell is a vegetarian? That sounds all, it sounds like vegetables and vegetables are awful. Yeah. And I said, my mom said, well, you know, that's someone who only wants to eat vegetables. I was just blown away. I was like, only wants to eat vegetables. I was like, well, then I'm a meatitarian because I only want to eat meat. Yeah. And, um, you know, and so I was always heavy meat and, you know, just doing this, doing this, this way of eating, you know, you, you, you eliminate a lot of, you know, harmful inflammatory factors in your body that, that lead to premature aging. And I, I haven't been exposed to those as much as other people have. And when I went back to full carnivorism, you know, several years ago, I, you know, I, I literally like started aging backwards again. You know, I was just like all, all this inflammation out of my, out of myself, my skin was getting better. Everything was getting better. And so, you know, I, I, and I feel fantastic. Um, 
you know, you're talking about sort of, uh, you know, how I sort of got it. I, I, as well, you know, obviously because of sports and things like that, you have to be concerned about your nutrition. You have to think about these things. And because, you know, I've, I was always interested in medicine and human biology, that was something that was just really interesting to me. And so I, you know, studied nutrition and I, and I looked at different things and, you know, obviously you're, you're taught what everyone's taught that you're supposed to eat, you know, carbohydrates, vegetables, you know, some meat, low fat, all these sorts of nonsensical things, which are, which are patently untrue, but you're learning these things. And obviously in medical school, you don't get taught nutrition. All you get taught is you just get these same tropes reinforced, you know, fat's bad, fat causes heart disease. It doesn't, it absolutely doesn't, but uh, that's what we're taught. And, um, you know, so when I was in, in, at the university of Washington, I was taking a class in cancer biology and, you know, thinking back when I was in seventh grade taking biology, you know, we learned that plants and animals are in an evolutionary arms race. And you'll see this on nature videos. They talk about this literally an evolutionary arms race plants becoming more and more poisonous. So less and less animals can eat them so they can survive and thrive. You know, if you eat a plant, they die, they don't want to be eaten. Right. And so, you know, and these animals being, you know, getting more and more adapted to specific poisons and specific plants, so they can eat that plant safely and other things can't. So now that's their dedicated food resource. They don't have to compete for, for resources. Um, well, what does that mean? That means that plants use poison. You know, every living thing has a defense, you know, or else it's, it's going to be not a living thing. And, you know, while animals can run away or fight back, plants can't. So they use poison as their main deterrent. And so we, you know, we learned that in seventh grade and then we're told to eat our spinach. And, you know, so I was taking this again in, in cancer biology and we were learning the same things again, but we're learning it in, in a cancer perspective. We're learning all the different, you know, carcinogens and so forth that are in Brussels sprouts. There's a, this is 20 years ago, 136 carcinogens found at that time in Brussels sprouts and over hundred and just white mushrooms, spinach, kale, lettuce, celery, cabbage, cucumber, everything that you'd ever eat. And we're giving pages of these things. They had 60, 80, or over hundred known human carcinogens each. They've been, they're abundant. We've known since the 1980s that there are 10,000 times more naturally occurring poisons in, in vegetables like spinach than the pesticides we spray on them by weight. And that the naturally occurring ones are several times more, you know, orders of magnitude times more uh, carcinogenic than the, the industrial pesticides we spray on them. That's why we have pesticides still. They were trying to ban them in the 1980s. Professor Bruce Ames from Berkeley did a, did a study, be, you know, saying that like, okay, is that, is that really true? Because I mean, think we've been using pesticides for 80 years without a problem. All of a sudden yeah. now they're causing a problem. So he did the studies and he found that actually the plants are worse for you. So if you're going to eat the plant anyway, you know, this idea of organic doesn't really change anything. It's just a way of selling you lettuce at four times the price. Right. And you know, so we, we were blown away by this. I remember literally like looking around, just thrashing around. Like everyone was looking around, just looking for like a TA who was like smirking in the corner. I'm like, ah, he's messing with you. But, you know, th there wasn't. And, and so all of a sudden it sort of dawned on us like, you know, Christ, this guy's serious. And I remember thinking in my head, but like, well, but vegetables are, are still good for you though, right? And, you know, he just must have read our minds because he looked at us and he said, I don't eat salad. I don't eat vegetables. No. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. So I was like, all right, screw plants. And I just stopped. And, you know, you go to the store and you're trying to, and I was like, well, what, what do I eat now? You know, you know, everything's a plant. And, you know, so I was looking around, it was just like, you know, there's plants and everything, you know, there's pasta, there's bread, there's, you know, any, any sort of mixed bag of something is going to have plants in it. And so I was like, well, eggs, that doesn't come from a plant or like meat that doesn't come from a plant milk that doesn't come from a plant. So I just ate eggs, meat and milk for about five years um, until I, you know, went back to England and, um, and uh, you know, just sort of didn't have the same access to food. A lot of the, you know, some of the food that I was getting was, was like breaded and things like that. I remember thinking I'm like, Ooh, this is sort of a plant. I don't really want it, but you know, ooh, is it, is it that much? It's just a bit of breading, a bit of crumb on it. And I was like, it was, I remember like a few months into it. Uh, I remember thinking I was sitting on a couch. I remember thinking, I was like, why don't I feel as superhuman as I normally do? Because, you know, after I stopped doing that, I also stopped drinking at the same time. And so I attributed it mostly to the drinking, but you know, I, I couldn't, I my, my exercise tolerance went through the roof. My athletic ability went through the roof. I was training absolutely just balls to the wall. I was training, you know, like, you know, six, eight hours a day, every day playing, you know, two, 
sometimes three games a weekend. I just wanted games, 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 games. I just want to play as much as I could. You know, I was playing for University of Washington. I was playing for Seattle. I would play in the second team's games, everything like that. I just wanted as much field time as I could get. And, and you know, I, I literally couldn't get tired. I couldn't run out of energy. I remember finishing, uh, you know, very tough, you know, game. It was, you know, a hard game with, uh, you know, in the Canadian uh, premiership. And I remember walking off field. I was just, I was like jittery. I was just like, I, I, I played open side flanker, which is sort of a cross between, you know, like a middle linebacker and a running back. You know, you're making a lot of hard tackles. You're making a sure. lot of runs. It's a, it's a very physical position. And so, you know, I, I'd make, you know, 40 tackles a game, 50 tackles a game. Sometimes it'd be a dead sprint everywhere, running the ball and so forth. And, you know, and I remember after the game, it was an hour and a half long game. And I'm, I'm like, I, 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 you know, I, I, that wasn't even a workout. Like I need to do something because I'm normally I'm used to working out for just hours and hours and hours and just at a dead sprint the whole time. I remember thinking in my head, I'm like, I've got to do something. I've got to go on a run. I've got to do, you know, I've, I've got to work out. I've got to get a proper workout in today. Right. And just right then our, our scrum half, you know, was another player on the team who's a very thick guy, you know, came up to me and just said, oh, that ref blew that whistle one minute later. I probably would have passed out, you know? And that, and so that was the difference in, in my fitness you know, compared to my other teammates, I would, it was just a very different level. And, um, and I just, I just literally felt superhuman. And, um, you know, and then all of a sudden I'm in England and I'm playing professionally and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking like, and I remember thinking, I was like, why don't I just feel as unbelievably amazing as I normally do? Am I just not working out as hard? Am I not working out as much? I'm like, well, it doesn't really sound right. You know, I'm doing two a days and things like that. So, you know, I couldn't really figure it out. And, you know, my, you know, I had, you know, L aches and niggling injuries and inflammation that I just didn't have before. And I just didn't feel like myself. I was still able to perform. I was still able to, you know, uh, do my job, but you know, it, it wasn't the same and it wasn't until sort of, and then at that point I sort of slipped off of it and there's big push for, you know, plant-based everything. Oh, you need this from this, you need that from that. And I was just like, well, okay, so you need, you know, mushrooms because they're good for anti-cancer sort of thing it has anti-vegf and i was like i don't don't have cancer like why am i taking yeah why do i need this yeah yeah exactly and you know and it's like okay it has this one thing that's maybe good for cancer if you have cancer which i don't but it also has a hundred things in it which can cause cancer so you know that never really you know made sense to me and uh but you know i just sort of sort of went along with it um against my will all vegetables are against my will my whole life, but, you know, I was doing that. And then, you know, I came across, um, you know, Sean Baker on, on Joe Rogan. My brother said, you know, I was like, Oh, there's this guy. He's a, you know, he's a doctor. He's an orthopedic surgeon. He played rugby in, in New Zealand. He said, you can get all your nutrition from meat. And, you know, I sort of thought about it and obviously it goes against everything that you're taught, but, sure, sure. but at the same time, I was like, well, it doesn't sound too far fetched because, you know, I basically did that for like five years and every few months I sort of thought to myself, well, like, do, do I need to eat a banana or something? Should I take a vitamin? And I was like, well, you know, I feel good and my gums aren't bleeding. So we'll just keep going with this. Right. And, um, you know, so I was like, well, you know, it's not, you know, it's not you out there. I mean, I, I did that. I basically did that for, you know, five years and, and so I was like, all right, well, I'll, I'll take a look at his video and, and let you know what I think within five minutes. I was like, this guy's more right than he knows, you know, because he was talking about a, you know, a lot of different things, you know, the n- nutrition side of things for meat and what you can get and something like all true. But, you know, I knew the things about, you know, plants being absolutely toxic for you, you know, I, and then, you know, the, all the new uh, research coming out and, you know, with like, you know, cholesterol and fat and, you know, obviously, you know, journal American yeah. Medical Association, you know, published all that, that, you know, this was basically fraud put about by the, the sugar company, you know, everything that you, you sort of addressed in your, you know, fat documentary, which I, I thought was, was very well done. I thought it was extremely oh, thank good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Not, yeah, not a problem. And thank you for making it. I think. Well, you know, let, let me, let me address what you just said about Sean Baker, yeah. you know, early on before Sean Baker became Sean Baker online. Yeah. Right. Um, I met Sean early on, had him over to the house. Um, yeah. And he, um, he was doing it as an experiment. He wanted to see if he could go six months yeah. and just eat nothing but meat and eggs. I think he was doing meat and eggs. Mm-hmm. I don't think there was anything else, just meat and eggs. And he was maybe uh, two or three months in and I was, you know, and we talked and, you know, we did a podcast like this. <clears throat> and then when it was over with, we were talking and my wife walked in, Serena walked in. And she was like, who was that guy? I says, Dr. Sean Baker. And uh, uh, he's just eating meat and nothing. She goes, that sounds crazy. I went, 
<laughs> I said, Serena, think about it. You have to fucking hide vegetables in creams for me and everything else. You know, you, you, you convinced me to eat one vegetable a day. I'm not very far off from it. She goes, yeah, I guess you're right. But yeah. I said, he's showing. And she goes, he looks very fit. I went, oh, yeah, he, you know, he's getting stronger and stronger as he goes, because that's yeah. all he's doing. You know, and then Sean Baker decided to turn it into, hey, he, he basically created this modern day carnivorous diet. But I remember yeah. talking to him about, you know, Stefanson and all these people who he wasn't really familiar with yet. Right. Like, well, you know, Stefanson got stuck up with the Inuit tribe in, in a tough winter and couldn't get out of there. And, you know, I, we went through that whole story and he was like, oh, yeah, I need to look more into that. It, it was kind yeah. of like that. He was so far at the beginning of this yeah. that he, he didn't realize what he had stumbled upon. Um, yeah. Something else you made me realize when you were talking about going to England versus here. You know, I started doing ultras back in the late 80s, early 90s, the term didn't really exist. Now, mm -hmm. everybody and their cousin is running 200 miles every weekend and doing yeah. all these races. It basically almost didn't exist. It was just a bunch of guys with beards down to their belly button that would go do this crazy stuff, you know, this kind of Forrest yeah. Gump crap. <laughs> but I was doing the stuff in the early 90s where we you know, I, I was doing bicycle ultras. Oh, okay, this is 500 miles. This is on the mountain bike for the next 24 hours. And you would get off of the mountain bike. Well, actually, you would start getting inflammation before the race is over with, mm -hmm. right? Like you would get start getting elephantitis in your ankles and up your calves mm -hmm. and everything. But because you're still moving, it wouldn't be that bad. But right. by the time you took a shower, when you got off that bike, and then, of course, after 24 hours, the first thing you do is, is just pass out, right? And you take right. a nap and you get up. And we used to kind of goof on it. It was like your knees. It was elephantitis, like from your right above your knees all the way down to your foot. You couldn't even yeah. sit your feet in it. People would wear some version. Crocs weren't around yet, but like you can only put yeah. like, um, you know, flip flops on or something. You couldn't put shoes on, right? Yeah. And it was the general consensus was, well, no one rides a bike for 24 hours at a really fast clip. Mm -hmm. That's why you're getting that, right? Yeah. And I would get it just like <clears throat> everyone else until I started riding the bike and only eating low carb, meaning they're yeah. you know, still having some vegetables, believe it or not. I wasn't having grain. I wasn't having any grain of any sort. I wasn't having any sugar. I was just eating meat. I was eating a lot of dairy. I was eating a lot of um, a lot of fattening dairy, not not low fat dairy, yeah. um, eggs and what have you. I would get off the bike after 15, 18 hours of practice, you know, in the practice run and go, hmm, elephantitis didn't come on yet. It's still not there. I'd wake up the next day, not only not have it, yeah, but wasn't as sore. You know, yeah. all the stuff that would normally hurt wouldn't hurt. Yeah, right? which was an amazing thing. And it doesn't take long until you go, okay, well, this is, you know, we always talk about in, in athletics, the optimal diet, what's optimal? Yeah, you know, how do we do this? And when you think about it, it's so simple to be optimal. It's very simple. Yeah. Yet, we still have these people, you know, there's doctors out there that there's trainers and everything else going, you can't you can't build muscle without carbohydrates. It's like, well, right. what does the carbohydrate yeah. have to do with building anything? Yeah. <laughs> it's an energy source. It has, is, there's no building blocks for, for uh, muscle. There's nothing, right? Yeah. It's just, it's nothing. What say you? Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, we, we, we say these things and we repeat them, uh, you know, so many times it just become, it just become, you know, law. And uh, you see this a lot in medicine, unfortunately, but people don't, people don't realize this. Or, oh, well, this is what doctors do. And they've done this for decades. Therefore, it must be true. I'm sorry, but a lot of things that we do in medicine, especially the ones that we've done for decades, are, are predicated on nothing. They were our best guess. And then when you actually do the studies and look at it, it's completely wrong. You know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, there's one example of this is, is uh, you know, kidneys. You know, like, so, oh, well, you know, if you have someone who has kidney problems, you want to be on like a low protein diet because, you know, 
breaking down the kidney, breaking down the, the protein and getting rid of the nitrogen, you put that in ammonia, and then that turns into urea and, you know, higher urea means, you know, poor kidney function and so forth. So there's this theoretical that if you're putting more nitrogen in your system, it's going to be harder on your kidneys to clear it. And so they put everyone on, on a low uh, protein diet and uh, their kidney problems just get worse and worse and worse. But like, oh, well, imagine what it would be like if we didn't do all this stuff for them. Um, but you don't see that when you actually, when we actually did the studies, um, found the opposite, you know, people that were eating more protein, especially animal protein were actually a not getting their kidneys worse, but, but actually improving. I had a, a good friend of mine that, um, was a power lifter, did like, you know, strongman competitions. He was 35 and he had kidney failure. You know, I think he had something like 19% kidney function. He had a four-year-old daughter and, you know, he was sort of, you know, posting some, morbid stuff online, you know, saying there's just like, you know, you know, I, I'm not going to live to see my daughter graduate high school. Like this is, wow. this is, this is enough time for me. And so I just reached out to him. I said, look, you know, um, you know, you can take this or leave this, but you know, I've been doing a lot of research into this. Um, you know, protein is not bad for your kidneys. Here are the studies. Um, there are a lot of things in plants that are bad for your kidneys. Here are the studies, you know, I've been doing carnivore. It's really helped me. I've helped people with it all these stuff, maybe something to give a try. And he said, you know what? Screw it. I might, you know, I've got nothing to lose. Might as well just try it. He went on this diet. His doctors were losing their minds and they're like, no, 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 you have to do this. Basically a whole food vegan diet with low protein and, and be on all these pills. And he said, you know what? Screw your pills, screw your vegetables. I'm doing this in three months. He was back up to 80% kidney function. You know, that doesn't happen. Wow. We, don't, we don't see that in medicine but we're seeing it now. And, you know, I'm in sort of Facebook groups and things like that. And there's a lot of people that have had that very similar uh, um, experience where they're, they're on the verge of having dialysis and all of a sudden they're back to normal. You know, um, there are a lot of things that we do. These things harm our bodies. And, you know, I think of it, I don't think of it as disease. I think of it as a, as a poison experience. You know, you, you know, if you have lead pipes, you're getting lead poisoning, you remove the pipes, your lead poisoning goes away. It's very simple. Right. Uh, but if you don't realize you've got lead pipes, you're in trouble. And now you're, you're treating the symptoms of that, of that poisoning and you're treating it as a disease. It's not a disease. It's, it's poisoning. And I think plants cause poisoning, carbohydrates cause poisoning in various different ways. And so when you remove that out, you're not going to have the symptoms of these diseases. And, you know, so, you know, to your point, you know, when you're not eating those things, you're not inflicting that damage onto your body. Your body's going to work much more optimally. I, you know, I've certainly noticed that, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't even get sore anymore, you know, since I, especially with the carbohydrates, when I got rid of those, you know, I, I, you know, mentioned this to, to Sean, but you know, I was, I was just back from Bangladesh. I hadn't worked out in months and, you know, I want to get back into it. I did a heavy, heavy leg workout. Anyway, I did 12, you know, heavy sets to failure, uh, various leg exercises. And normally something like that would have me reeling. Like, like you can't sit on the toilet two days later, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you're just, you're, you're literally in tears going upstairs or something like that. Um, and I, it was nothing. It was like nothing happened. I was just like, well, you know, am I just working out like a little bitch or something? Like I'm not pushing myself. I was like, well, you know, I, I went, I did 12 sets and I went to failure on each set, but I wasn't like jello legged at the end of it. I hadn't worn myself out. So I was right. like, all right, well, let's try that next time. I was just all just trying to wear myself out. And I, you know, I just started, you know, I did the whole 12 set thing, but then I was just like, all right, now I'm just going to just keep doing squats and I'm going to just keep doing sets of squats until I, I wear myself out. And, you know, I, I, at the time I was, I was listening to um, a lot of books on tape by Thomas Sowell, who's like one of my favorite you know, writers and, and thinkers and uh, economists. And so I just put on one of his, one of his books and I was just listening to it. And I just, I just did set after set after set after set. And after a while, I sort of realized, I was like, I've just done another 20 sets of squats. By the way, failed. folks, don't try this at home. Uh, <laughs> Anthony is a professional athlete and he's a doctor. Please don't. People will listen to this and go, wait a minute. I need to do yeah. <laughs> You know, to your point, I tell this to people sometimes. I do consults with people on the phone. And I always say, you know, 10 years ago, I would always, you know, because I do push, pull legs, push, pull legs mm -hmm. twice a week. Right. And, and I, I still do. You can see I have a squat rack behind me and yeah. it's either done there. or one of the two or three gyms I belong to in town. Uh, I'm, I still work out like a madman at 59. Nice. Now I have to think it used to be, Oh wait, I know I did legs yesterday because my legs are sore today. Now I right. have to, yeah. did I do legs or back? What, what day am I on today? I, 
I really have to give myself some thought because I'm not feeling something all the time. And I might yeah. have more soreness from the workout the day before. So I, was going, I have to literally go look at my book to see which yeah. workout I'm on because I, you know, to me, working out is like brushing my teeth or wiping my ass. It's just done. You know, yeah. I've been doing it since I, I walked in a gym when I was eight years old and I still do it. So I have to really think of, oh, wait, what, what did I do yesterday? Because each day rolls into the next for me when it comes to working out, when you don't have that soreness anymore. And yeah. when you try to tell that to people, they go, really? Come on, really? Are you just yeah. like, no, this is a reality. And if you yeah. think it's just me, <clears throat> my wife is 60. Mm -hmm. And she's running this coming is it this Saturday or next. God, I hope it's next Saturday. She's running 100K, right? Oh, wow. She, yeah. ran, <clears throat> she ran a 50 she ran a 50 miler just a couple of weeks ago. She's running hundred K and you know, she's still running long distances, right? At 60, yeah. there's no slowdown here. When yeah. you know, my parents, I remember one time when I was like, um, I want to say my mom was sub 50 years old by a, a couple of years. And I was going to go water skiing. I grew up in Southern Louisiana before I moved to California, but I grew up in Southern Louisiana and I happened to be home and one of my buddies said, hey, man, we haven't been on the water, water skiing for a long time. So my mom was out there. I said, mom, why don't you hop in a boat? You can watch, watch your old boy here. And she goes, oh, mama's too old to get in a boat. I'm like, yeah, too old to get in the, yeah. I'm asking you to go. So my mom is not athletic. You know, she was a librarian. And I said, mom, I'm not asking you to ski. I mean, she goes, oh, it's too bumpy and it's going to bump me around the whole thing she was she felt too old to get in a boat yeah right you know what i mean it's like oh that that you know that's not for me anymore and yeah. here i have serena who's 60 and there's no sign of stop right? right it's just go 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 and when i think about it my grandparents they all came from italy and they all lived to be either to 100 or just shy of 100 yeah. And it wasn't like they were limping into the finish line. Right. Yeah. I, I would go home to visit. My grandfather was in his 80s and he would say, hey, Vinny, how's it going? I would have to look. He would be in a tree holding on with one hand, <laughs> cutting with a handsaw, pruning his own, climbing trees in his 80s. Yeah. It's like when you and, and by the way, meat, eggs, fish, meat, eggs, fish watch, rinse, repeat, you know, that's all they did. Yeah. Right? And they just kept it going. Right. And that's when I looked at that and went, wait a minute, this is what they did. Mm -hmm. Now I live in a generation where they're telling me you need 12 carbs a day across the bottom or 11 carbs a day. And then on the next level, if you add it all up, I think it's like, I, I did it in my movie. It's like 22 servings of carbohydrates in a day. Mm -hmm. And then I'll tell you what the serving is. Right. Yeah. Right. Do you know what to say? You're a doctor. You're a smart doctor. You're Doogie Howser. What's the serving <laughs> size? Do you know? Absolutely no idea. No. <laughs> You're supposed to have 22 of them a day. Yeah. Yeah. Right. How does that? Yeah. 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 So, you off, but go on. No, no, no. You're fine. Yeah. No. I, but, you know, to your point, like, you know, people, you know, people always <laughs> think that, that, um, you know, people that lived previously, I uh, had very short lives. You know, I've, I've heard other doctors saying like, oh, well, you know, in the 1800s, people only lived to, you know, 32. So, you know, and it's just like, that is bullshit. You know, that's average from birth, you know? And when you have three kids dying in infancy, it tends to pull down that average a little bit. You know, the other two kids have to grow up to be pretty damn old just to have that be, you know, 36. So, you know, I looked at the census data because like, you know, I thought it was bullshit. Anytime I hear something, I was like, that doesn't sound right. That sounds like bullshit. I look it up. And so, you know, I've, I've had to do this, you know, living overseas and so forth. You have so many people just, you know, trashing America. Oh, America is this, America is that. Oh, really, is it? And so I get into it with people. And so I just got used to looking these things up. And I was like, I need to know my facts. I need to know what's actually there and not so I can, you know, I can defend my position. And so, you know, look these things up. I looked at the census data. I have it on my phone. And, you know, if you look at, you know, in 1850 from birth in America, the average life expectancy was 36. But if you get to 10, it's 56. 
You know, it's a very different game, you know, when you get out of those childhood, uh, you know, causes of death and, right. and illness. And as you, as you go further and further and further and get into adulthood and so forth, it actually is, is quite paired and matched. And they had, you know, every 10 years, you know, they had this, this data. And so you could, you could look at you, I think it went up to 2016 or something like that. And so, you know, you're looking at, you know, 1850, if you made it to 80, you make it to 80, 86. If now, if you make it to 80, you make it to 88, you know what I mean? So it's just like, right. you know, as you, the, the further along you got, the, the closer it, it got to each other. Um, you know, and then you, and then you look at, uh, you know, my, my great grandfather was born in, you know, uh, 1875. He was, died in 1975 wow. at home, you know, and, um, you know, and it wasn't in a nursing home, no, no signs of dementia and so forth. He, you know, he would have a, you know, whiskey or two a day, smoke three cigarettes. He, he golfed basically up until his death. Wait, and, he uh, smoked three cigarettes because, a day. Uh, because people smoke smokers seem to smoke like a pack a day or half a pack a day, like a yeah. number, the, the three, he smoked three a day. It's three. Yeah. I, that, that was what I said. He was like, he, he limited it to three a day. You know, he would roll his own and so forth. But, you know, you're talking about Doogie Hauser. This guy literally was Doogie Hauser. He was in wow. the, you know, the 1800s. He, um, he was, uh, he went, got into Columbia medical school when he was 16 years old. This was back when it was a six year medical program, you know, straight out of high school. And so he went early. He went when he was 16. He finished a six-year program in four years, graduated when he was 20. He's still to date the youngest graduate from Columbia Medical School. And, um, and so in New York, you couldn't start your residency until you were 21. So he actually had to go home and hang out for a year like Doogie Hauser before he could actually go and, and start his residency. Yeah. And, um, and went, on from, went on from there. His brother ended up being, you know, a um, uh, you know, a doctor at Stanford. And, and I think he was a professor there as well, but he ended up down in Redlands and uh, helped found the hospital there in the golf course. And, um, and just, just really loved the desert, desert Southwest. And, you know, he had the 13th medical license that California ever gave out. Um, he was the only doctor licensed to open the abdomen and thorax in the Western United States, like West of the Mississippi and so forth for, for a time. And uh, yeah, so he, he was literally Doogie Hauser, And, um, but, you know, this, this guy lived at home and he, you know, he, and, and was obviously getting older. His body wasn't working as well, but you know, his brain was always there and he ate a lot of meat. And then one of the things was he, he told my mom, the best thing to give a, a kid when you're first starting on solids is like the juice from a roast. You can get them that that's something you have is has a lot of nutrients. It has a lot of nutrition that's good for them. It's something they can eat. And then you start giving them softer, softer meat. But that was the whole thing. You give infants meat that's you start them on meat right. and so forth um you know and then you go back you know um you're talking about um you know stefanson uh who's great i you know i absolutely love that guy yeah. um just before him was uh you know dr j h salisbury you know who, mm -hmm. who the salisbury steak was named after sure. you know and he did a 30-year research project looking at you know what's the optimal diet for for humans and um, you know, he lived with the Native Americans for a while, studied them. You know, these guys were just eating buffalo. You know, the Plains Indians are just eating buffalo, high fat buffalo. And, um, you know, these guys were living to be 110, 115 years old, you know, Sprite and Spry, you know, not, you know, turning, you know, sitting in a nursing home, turning into dust and for 40 years straight, but, you know, with a pack on their back following the buffalo herds day in and day out, you know, at 115. And, you know, everyone dismissed this saying that, well, you know, that's just them saying that they just put great stake in, in, you know, longevity, but at the same time, you know, they're all saying this and they're saying this on different continents. who have never met each other. The same with the, you know, the native Australians, yeah. uh, you look at, you have looked at, um, you know, explorer uh, records from like the 1600s coming to Australia. There's always a chapter on, on the diet of the natives and they'd marvel how they only ate meat and they were so strong. They were so fit. And they were so, you know, they were so young looking, even though they got, you know, very, very old and talking about how, how long they lived. Yeah. Have you seen the movie, um, The Magic Pill? Have I, I haven't, but I've, I've certainly heard about it. Yeah. Watch it. Watch it next. Because um, um, the guys that did that, he's from Australia and uh, he's a really good guy. I can't think of his name. He's been on this podcast. I should remember his name because he was the first person to call me and congratulate me on fat when it did so well. Oh, um, nice. But that movie has done very well. Um, he basically went to the Aboriginal people. That's one of the things he did in the movie. And mm. because the, these people, you know, for generations ate meat, 
right? That's all. And then now all the aboriginals now are dying young and they have nothing but disease and they're all morbidly obese mm -hmm. and everything else. And they went back to these heads of these tribes and said, hey, we're going to put you on these diets and the whole thing. And mm -hmm. they went, oh yeah, this is, this is how we ate when we were kids. Why did we yeah, go away right. from that? You know, it happens so mm -hmm. slowly that we don't see it happening. I always say that about uh, artificial intelligence, right? And I'm, I'm yeah. going to make a connection here. You know, everybody goes, yeah, one day it's going to be all AI. And I always tell them AI is here already and it's fucking you up. And they'll go, what are yeah. you talking about? And I'll <laughs> say, okay, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, everyone my age, I'm 59, everyone my age had somewhere between 35 and 45 phone numbers in their head. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You just knew phone numbers. Like if you said yeah. Todd Robert, I would tell you his phone number. If you said Melissa Giat, I would tell you her phone number. If you said my grandparents, I, you knew all of your friends' phone. Nothing was written down. You just yeah. knew their numbers, right? The yeah. average person somewhere between 35 and 40. I'm going to ask you, smart man, how many numbers do you have in your head right now, phone numbers? Yeah, I've got mine I, because I give that out. But I absolutely remember that too. I've, I've made, I've sort of commented on that before because when I was in, you know, high school, I, you know, I didn't have a cell phone until I was in my twenties. Right. And so, um, and, and at that point, I knew no one's number. But I, you know, I, I knew a lot of people's numbers before that. And and every now and then, I would just sort of like write them all out just to see, you know, oh well, you know, what if I forget them or whatever. You know, I it was it was over a hundred. You know, sometimes when I would write these things out. And, uh, and that would just, that would just be in my head all the time. Can't remember all of them. I remember. My, but now, my, now you have one. Do you have your mom's number in your head? I, I have my, my parents' house number. And that's taken me a while to remember. I remember my phone number when I was growing up in Kirkland. I remember my phone number when I was a kid in, um, in Ventura. And then like, and I know my cell phone now. I, I know my parents' number now. So basically I have four numbers in my head. But basically. at one time yeah. you rolled out a hundred. That's, Over 100, yeah. You know, that's AI seeping in, right? Yeah. The same thing, you look at these Aboriginal people and these women are going, oh, we used to eat like this. When did, <clears throat> when did we stop? What happened? It happens yeah. without you knowing it's happening. It's happening all yeah. the time. Nothing in this world is static. It's always, it's dynamic. It's always moving. We don't realize it's moving all the time, but it's moving, right? Yeah. It, it, it could be a glacial pace, but it's moving and you'll look back and go, well, wait, we used to do this, that, and the other thing. I have to force myself to go hunting now. When I was a kid, it was an <laughs> every weekend of, you know, I grew up in Southern Louisiana. You, you, you either went hunting or fishing. I have yeah. to plan a trip now to go hunting. It's like, yeah. uh, it's a gathering, right? Yeah. I have a trip planned in, in England over the holidays to go shoot some birds. Nice. Right. I never used to plan hunting. You know, the foreman yeah. and Todd Robert would say to me on Friday afternoon, what you doing tomorrow? I don't know. Want to go hunting? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Nikki Latino, what are you doing tomorrow? Nothing. Want to go deer hunting? Yep. Yeah. Now, my brother-in-law called me three months ago. Should we put you on the list to get you into a shoot, as they call yeah. it over there? Yeah. That's where we are now. I got to fucking get yeah. on the list to get in the shoot. <laughs> I, I don't know. How does that work? What happened in our lives where, and I, I laugh about this every morning, I shoot skeet competition. And mm -hmm. my grandfather used to tell me, the one that used to climb trees, he, he goes, you know, we were so poor. I love the, we were so poor story, but they were, they were impoverished, right? They, they came from Italy yeah. and they, they lived in, in what was formerly a slave quarter. They raised 11 kids right. in a two room slave quarter. And, he said, you know, my dad gave me this single shot shotgun and he would give me five shells and he would say to me, you better come back with six rabbits. And that's all <laughs> we had to eat. And, you know, I'm sure there was some exaggeration in there, but he yeah. wasn't meant to miss. And I think about yeah. that every morning because I shoot somewhere between 75 and 100 shells every morning. And I'm like sitting there going, my grandfather's head would explode right now to see what's happened. Yeah. You know, each shell meant someone in his family got to eat. Yeah. And now I'm just blowing that away, just blowing it away. That's the world we, we're pretending. I feel every morning yeah. I go out there and, well, I'm doing this because it's sport and it's competition and I do this and I go to competition. But we're pretending at life. I'm shooting yeah. orange looking clays. 
I'm pretending, yeah. right? Yeah. We don't, we don't battle anymore. We call it 15s and 7s and 5s. No one yeah. goes into battle. You know, no. you have real consequences in battle. Yeah. You no. ah, play rugby seven, drink some whiskey after the game. You know, we're pretending now. It's all pretending. Yeah. But at some point, we have to stop pretending. And I'm saying all this to bring, I, I want to change the subject if you have a few more minutes to stick with me. Yeah, of course. You have no idea about it. I think I told you right before we started, I have a new documentary coming out that's mm -hmm. just looking at pretend food, right? Right. Impossible meat, beyond burgers, impossible. You know, th these companies are out there. There's billions of dollars behind them. When, when you see this documentary, you will shit your pants. If you eat the yeah. stuff, you will also shit your pants. Yeah. But it's not, it's not just... It's not just companies like Unilever. It's not just Walter Willett at, at Harvard anymore. It's not just the World Health Organization. It's not just this Cargill, Tyson Foods. These are meat companies. They're yeah. dropping billions in this fake meat industry. And the reason they're doing it is because they see this as the future. Yeah. We have politicians making this as policy. You go to New York, they're doing meatless Mondays. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? It's just like you don't have phone numbers in your head anymore. And these mm -hmm. Aboriginal women are going, when did we stop? There's yeah. so, the women, are, these very smart women in these tribes are going, what, what? you got to watch that movie. When did we stop? Yeah. What happened on that day when we went? Was it a day or did it just seep in? You yeah. know, after Katrina, Everybody went, we're fine. And then they looked down and they had water at their ankles. Yeah. And they went, oh, there's a little water here. Next thing you know, the water is up at their knees. And then the, it's at their hips. And they're going, what the fuck? What's happening? Now they're swimming and now they're on rooftops and now they're dying. No one died yeah. in the hurricane down there in New Orleans. They died right. when the levee broke. And it just started rising and nobody was ready for it. It just kept yeah. rising and nobody, it was coming in slowly. Right. Yeah. That's what we're doing. It's a lullaby. We're putting everybody to sleep. If we just rock mm -hmm. the baby, rock the baby, rock the baby. What say you? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like the, the old, uh, you know, the old saying, like, you, you know, you have to know how, you know, just take away people's freedoms and, and so forth. You're not going to give it up willingly all at once so you have to know how to boil a frog right you know you throw a frog in a pot of boiling water it's just gonna you know it's too quick it'll jump right out so you put it in a pot with room temperature water and you slowly turn up the heat and by the time it's uh you know by the time the frog realizes what's going on it's too late and so i think the, you know you're right We're, we are getting into that and um you know they're trying to slowly put these things in just inundate us with uh, these, these sorts of ideas that they're, pro because it's all marketing, you know, it's just, like you say, you're putting billions of dollars into this. This is an investment for them. They want to recoup their investment. And so they're saying, this is the best thing. This is the most wonderful thing. This is best for the environment. And, you know, you actually look at it. It's absolutely not, you know, these, these, uh, you know, the impossible burger and so forth, you know, this, this is, uh, this, uh, this chemical slop, and, you know, I think someone was, was looking at this and the amount of estrogen that was just in these impossible burger patties, you know, some, you know, multiple, like 20 times the amount of estrogen uh, that was in, um, or maybe hundreds of times of estrogen, uh, you know, amount of estrogen is in the birth control pill, yeah. you know, the, you know, like, uh, you know, soy milk and things like that. Oh, it's so good for you. Really? There's enough estrogen in soy milk that if a man drinks eight glasses of soy milk a day, you know, ongoing, that's enough estrogen to grow breasts in a man. You know, we're taught oh, yeah. that, in, you know, that's one of the few nutritional things we are taught in medical school is, you know, advise your pregnant patients not to eat soy because it can, it can hormonally disrupt the development of that child. Men who are trying to conceive should avoid soy as well for the same reasons. You know, these things um, are quite harmful. And, you know, and they say, well, this is, this is going to save the environment and so forth. There is, there is, Zero, a zero evidence of that. B, there's a lot of evidence against that. 
You know, when you, when you grow a crop, you necessarily have to destroy an entire ecosystem. You have to kill all the plants, all the animals just to grow one crop. And you till the soil, you're losing topsoil that blows away, that rains away. And that that's what happened in the dust bowl era. That's why we had lost all our topsoil and so forth. You know, the land was turning, you know, the middle of America, you know, one of the most, you know, uh, you know rich lands in the world that was turning into uh, a Sahara desert almost did we realized it was because of our farming practices we started changing those and it, and it mitigated that and sort of reversed that um, but you know now we're, we're we're still doing this we're losing 27 billion tons of topsoil every year that's an area the size of Kentucky every year it's a it's a finite resource it takes 500 years to grow half an inch of topsoil I was a guy, Peter uh, Ballers, said who I've, I've spoken to before, not on a show, but just, you know, um, uh, we just, just were chatting once. Uh, very interesting guy, has done a lot of talks and things like that, has a PhD in forage agronomy. And, you know, he, he just lays out the facts. Um, you know, when you grow a crop that draws nutrients out of the soil, okay? So what replaces that? It's usually animals. Animals are part of the ecosystem. It's a symbiotic relationship. They eat down these dead, dead plants and they, you know, um, you know, excrete waste, which is actually food for these, these plants and they replenish the soil. Um, so when you get rid of that and you have these massive, massive farms, uh, you, you don't have that cycle anymore and you're killing the animals that get on your land and try to eat your crop and so forth. Oh, you're so, going to see all of that and more in Beyond the Bottom, my new movie. I, I, by the yeah. way, <clears throat> I get de death threats all the time. You know, yeah. I have friends <laughs> around me right now in this room. And it means you're doing something right. If exactly. Happens. And yeah. When, when you see, I'm showing everything in this movie, you will see, right. you know, they, they have to go out in the cover of night with, with you know, the, the special yeah. goggles and everything. And they're, they're shooting thousands of pounds of hogs and deer and right. everything else that no one's eating because, yeah, yeah. you know, what are you going to do? You, you, you would have to field dress and then, you know, get this to someone, nobody, you can't show up to, and as the farmer said in this thing, he's a soybean farmer. He goes, yeah. you can't show up at someone's doorstep at two o'clock in the morning. I have a thousand pounds of hog. Would you like it? If you yeah. don't feel that stuff, it all goes to waste. Um, yeah. This is going on all over the place. Um, you want to talk about the environmental impact. Most yeah. of the crap is made in China. It's shipped here. So, you know, there's a lot of diesel to truck it over here. Right. And yeah. then we have to manufacture this crap. So you're spewing more stuff into the environment. So it's not healthy for you or the environment. And by the way, uh, he was talking about Peter Ballastat. Folks, you can go back. Uh, Peter's probably been on a half a dozen shows here. And I've been on Peter's podcast. Um, Peter's one of our favorites. Whenever I'm on some speaking tour, I always look to see if Peter's going to be there because out of everyone, he's the first guy I take to dinner. He, he's the guy you want to sit with because um, he's he's that kind of special. The guy is uh, he's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you're a thousand percent correct. It's, you know, the, you know, uh, Dr. Robert Lustig, who was on the show. Lustig. Lustig's fantastic. I love that guy. Yeah. I love him. Folks, if you ever want to don't even go to the podcast or to that we did together. Go find Sugar, the Bitter Truth on YouTube. This guy in his book talked about and on this podcast talked about young girls at five and six years old growing breast because of all yeah. the estrogen They're they're maturing and getting periods before they hit their 10th birthday. We're now Jesus. learning that boys are turning into girls, right? They, yeah. they, 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 they don't have the sexual drive that we had. And I still, yeah. but then again, I'm Italian, yeah. you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's all gone. It's just, you know, these kids aren't, they're not having sex. They're not because, you know, it's number one, they're not leaving their basements. They're not social. They don't yeah. know what to do. <laughs> and they're turning into big old fucking girls. Yeah. You know, we got enough girls, folks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we need someone out there fucking them so we can continue yeah. on as a, I think that's the medical term, right? Fucking yeah. them. Um, but yeah, none of that is going on anymore, right? We're not doing yeah. what we did. And again, it goes back to that lullaby. Just mm. rocking them to sleep, man. Just rocking yeah. them to sleep, and it's not good. 
Yeah. Well, you know, like you're saying, like I, you, know, you guys, you know, dressed in, you know, in fat documentary, you know, talking about Kellogg's and things like that, you know, they, they wanted to suppress people's natural uh, sexual urges. You know, just like the guy was just beside himself, you know, just at the thought of just people fornicating and masturbating across, across the country. And, um, you know, he's also the one who pushed um, circumcision, male circumcision in America and saying like, oh, this is very good health. Uh, for health reasons, blah, blah, blah. there's no health reasons. It just makes it more difficult. And then we figured out lube and that was the end of that. So, you know, but, um, but that, that you get these deranged people with these, you know, these deranged notions about how other people should live. And so they do things to manipulate other people and make them live the way they think they should. It's none of your damn business. You know, that, that's you know, what America is predicated on is, is people get to live their own damn lives. And as long as you're not hurting someone else, you know, back off. It's none of your damn business. And, you know, unfortunately people are making it their business and, you know, Kellogg did it. Um, and that, that screwed people up. People are doing this. Well, you know, you're, you're going to hurt yourself. You have to do this, you know, meatless Mondays, you know, in Australia, it's, they've, they've, they've taken it just to the next level. You know, they have, they have schools here, elementary schools where you're, you, they, the teachers will check their student lunches, the school lunches, that, that gets sent with their parents. And if there's not enough fruits and vegetables, or if there's too much meat, they'll get, they'll take it away and they'll send them. Really? Home. Yeah. yeah. And there's, there are schools here that are, they're pure vegan. You cannot send anything besides fruits and vegetables and, and, you know, grains and crap like that in <sighs> with your kid, you, you cannot really? feed your own child meat, you know, at all, at all, at all. You know, so a piece of one piece of lunch meat, no, that's out of balance. You can't do it. You know, I mean, there, there are just tons of studies showing, you know, the severe harm that, you know, vegan and vegetarianism have on kids, short, st- you know, short stature, low bone mineral density, um, you know, like, you know uh, developmental delays, autism, um, all these sorts of things, you know, they're, you know, intellectually delayed as well. I'm very sorry. So I'm on lockdown here in Australia. This is another. This is another yeah, I was going to, I was going to ask that. Um, yeah. And so I have to check in with the, the cops here just to make this so they know that. Yeah, yeah. And folks, what he's saying is he was traveling and he's back there. So he's got to show that he's in his house. And yeah. I, it's so funny that he's saying this because I was going to bring that up because Australia <laughs> has been twice as crazy about that as any other country. Right. You guys are the worst. Yeah. I think Canada yeah. is yeah. up there with you guys. I would believe it just because it's Canada, but um, yeah, I, you know, I've been here. It's, it's very bad. So, you know, in Perth and Western Australia, it's um, we, we've sort of been better than most. I mean, they've certainly tried. They've certainly tried to go totalitarian on us, uh, but they really haven't had any justification for that because you know, there hasn't been a you know, case of, of COVID in Western Australia since I think June, 2020. So they really, and they really want to shut us down. They really want to be as, as draconian as the other states are, but they just have, they have absolutely no uh, justification for it. So even when, when one person, um, we were locked down for like four months, we had no cases of COVID. I think it was like three at the beginning and that was it. And there's nothing after that. And they kept us locked down for like four months. And then after that, um, there was one case, but it wasn't actually here. He had been in Perth and then he flew over to Melbourne, tested negative in Perth, tested positive in Melbourne. They shut down Western Australia, all of Western Australia, not just one Perth. Person. Got- so all right, so let, let, me put, let me put this in perspective. Yeah. You're driving down the road in Australia. You get in a car accident, someone dies. Yeah. Does everyone stop using cars? No, not at all. Period? Well, why? Someone yeah. died. Someone got in a car accident. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So yeah. one dingo eats one baby, as they say over there, right? Yeah. Do yeah. they do they outlaw camping out by that big yeah. rock? What do they do? I need to know. Because <laughs> it makes no sense. You know, I live, uh, looks like you froze up there. So I'm going to wait for you to come back. Can you hear me, Anthony? I'm here. Uh, he, you're going to come back. Um, I heard you for a second there. Maybe it's the Australian government cutting him off. Hmm. Anthony, can you hear me now? Uh, I can hear you. Are you able to hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Now I can hear you. Your picture's not back yet, but I can hear you. So, um, Interestingly enough, 
I live near a university here in Virginia. And I went to Oh, we lost Anthony altogether. I'm gonna see if I can get him back. Um, see if we can get him back. Oh, there he is. Here he comes. Okay. Are you there? <laughs> Anthony, can you hear me? Hmm. Oh, let's see if he comes on. Tommy, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, he's pixelated. Anthony, hang up, uh, and I'll 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 send you a brand new link and click on that link, and we'll see if that works. I don't know if I could do this without his number. Uh, it won't it won't work. Um, you know what? Mm, what are we going to do here? Um, let's see if he comes back on. I'll tell you guys the story. I, I was at a UVA football game the other day. Nobody had a mask on. No one. But then the day or two before I was driving around campus, it seemed like everyone had a mask on. And then after the game, everyone had a mask on again. So if I'm following the signs, does it mean if you're watching 18 to 21 year old athletes on a football field. No problem. Just wondering how that works. Um, I'm going to call and uh, Anthony back off the air. In just a second to say goodbye to him. It doesn't look like he's going to come back on. Folks, uh, you know what to do. We all go shopping on Amazon. Before you go to Amazon, please go to vinnytotteries.com. Click through the banner. It puts a little coal on the fire. It gets my train down the track. We also have the super fan page. And my new movie, um, I'm not sure when the show is going to come out, but go and get it. Go check it out. Beyond Impossible is out there. You guys need to go and do that. So on behalf 